Were you involved at all with the Temple of the Dog record? I was not involved. Um, but I will say, because Rick Prosher produced that record, and, and that's a pure Rick record where he tracked and mixed that record, and I got to work with Rick for a decade, and, and he was my mentor. So I know, although I wasn't on the, the Temple record, but I just know exactly what he did, you know, because I got to learn his all his techniques. I know, I feel like I know intimately, like, how that process went. Was there anything about that process that sticks out to you from what Rick has told you? Well, Rick, Rick is an extraordinarily uh, talented producer and he's very light. Uh, he's not heavy handed, um, especially te technically with, with the gears and engineer as well. It's, it's very natural. He, he doesn't do a lot of EQ or compression. He just gets really nice levels and he gets nice levels to tape. And um, when you listen, I feel like Temple of the Dog is a really great example of just a pure, uh, honest recording. I know they did it really fast, and they did it in two weeks. When it comes to Temple of the Dog, obviously one of the things that stands out is the fact that Chris Cornell and Eddie Vedder were part of the same project. Did Rick ever talk to you about how he recorded those vocalists? Like, was there anything similar or different about their approach? Rick, technically, Rick never talked, but I know what, you know, I know like they used uh, um, a 47 FET, uh, which is on the bass drum mic down there. Uh, that was the vocal mic they used. and. No, it was done really simply. And I know lot, there's lots of like histori historic stories about, you know, because Chris wrote the record and really it was his music. And um, Eddie was up in town trying out for what was to be Pearl Jam. And there was no intention for him to sing on that record. But it was just that he was floating around the studio. And, and from what I heard was uh, Chris heard Eddie sing in the lounge and said, hey, man, why don't you try singing on this song? So it was really... Like that's, I, I like that story in that it was really just sort of dumb luck that the timing was such that Eddie was in town while they were here recording Temple and it just by chance he ended up on the record, you know? And I'd like to, I always like to think that that must have been a real true mo moment for Stone and Jeff to hear Eddie sing against Chris, you know, and sound great. So for, I gotta assume for Stone and Jeff in that moment, like, whoa, our guy, our guy sounds good. Cause they, I, you know, there wasn't even, it wasn't even a band yet, you know, yeah. there wasn't a band yet. So I mean, what a, what a, what a way to try out for a band is to show up to Seattle, sing on this legendary record, you know, the sound of that record is very indicative of this room. Like there's no tricks happening. It's just what the band sounds like. The drums would have been right there. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a little bit represents the, the, that whole grunge movement of like great music captured and really honestly and, and great performances. Did Rick ever tell you any either funny stories or interesting stories about Temple of the Dog that stick out to you? So I think famously, uh, what I heard, again, this is for the history books, is that Eddie flew up here to try out for Pearl Jam, but he didn't have a place to stay. So I'd heard he lived on the couch here in the control room for those two weeks. Really? I believe Rick mentioned that. I mean, it was a long time ago, but that sort of legend has it that Eddie lived here at the studio for those few weeks. Really? While he was up in town. Yeah. Was there any other point in time that he lived here? Not that I know, no. I think by the time I worked with them, I'm sure he, he had a place at that point. So I was, you know, probably a good year or so later. Yeah, that's crazy. So he worked, he lived here for like two weeks. That's crazy. Uh, well, he <laughs> slept on the couch and we don't have the original couch. That was one of the first things we did when we took over the studio. It was the original couch, was literally the original couch. And mind you, this studio has been open since 1985. So that couch was pretty gnarly. <laughs> apparently that was a couch that Eddie Vedder slept on. Where's that couch now? Do you guys just toss it? You know... When we took over the studio, everyone said, oh, you got to put that up on eBay. And, and uh, we wanted to, but we just wanted to get rid of it, too. So we ended up throwing the dump. Jeez. So, I know, missed opportunity. <laughs> Damn. That would be in a, it would be in a museum right Maybe now. Maybe for so a great photo shoot or something. You know what I mean? You got to get Eddie sleeping on that thing. So here's the important question. Did Eddie pay rent when he was... Uh, <laughs> when he was <laughs> I don't believe he did. No worries. So another artist that um, I've heard was here when they were homeless for a period was Alice in Chains. Did you ever hear about that? You know, there's such a history with Alice in Chains here at London Bridge, and, and I am young enough to not really know. Um, but what I've heard was both Lane and Jerry were in separate bands before they met. I know one was a band called Sleaze, and I don't remember what the other little band was. But here, here's my impression. Again, I, I don't know. This is how I've understood history was that um, Alice, the, group, the members in Alice started recording here simply because they lived in the North End. And... There's not a lot of big studios in Seattle, so there's not a lot of options, different studios for them to go, and it just made sense for them to come here. And I think they were just making demos. This is you know, years before Alice in Chains, but I think they were just making demos here with Rick, because Rick owned the studio, Rick Prosher, and mm -hmm. he was an engineer. So they were making demos, 
with Rick Brasher. But while they were doing that, you know, the band and Rick were developing a sound. You know, this is this is a new it was a new studio at the time and it's a new room. And they're getting these, they're developing these big drum tones on the demos. You know, so when Alice in Chains got signed, they it made the most amount of sense for them to come back up here and do the demos. The album demos were done here with Rick because they had a relationship with him and he was developing the sound. So I'd really like to think that that's where a lot of that sort of the, the Seattle sound, at least this tracks that the records that came out of London Bridge sort of like got seeded with Alice doing demos with Rick where they had a chance to like sort of develop these sounds. So by the time, you know, Facelift came, they came into the drums here. Rick didn't produce Facelift, but uh, Dave Jordan did. But, you know, they were, this was kind of their home at that point. And, and again, too, because the Seattle has always been a tight knit yeah. music community, I think, you know, the, Alice was having luck here with Rick Rosher. So Soundgarden came in, they did uh, Louder Than Love here, you know, and then, and then Pearl Jam came in and Love And so I think that kind of, start a whole wave of, of those bands coming here, knowing that they're going to get these big, giant drum sounds. Did you have any relationship with Mother Love Bone at all? No. I mean, Mother Love Bone did their record here. Um, I, I mean, I know the drummer. I've met the drummer a handful of times so besides that. And obviously Stone and Jeff. I'd work yeah, there, yeah, but cool. yeah, no. I love that record. I, yeah, I mean, I, I was a huge fan of that record before you even knew what Linden Bridge was, you know? Really? Yeah. So again, like for me to be here at 19, 20 years old, it's like, you know, Rick... Again, he was my mentor, and uh, he had uh, an incredible career. You know, in the early '90s, he basically, you know, once Pearl Jam 10 was out, he was launched to like a list producer. So for me, like the first three years I worked here, we did nothing but hit records. Like it was phenomenal. Like Candlebox came in, hit record. Blind Melon came in, hit record. Zach Wild came in, Pride and Glory. That was well, I don't know if that was a hit record, but it was a cool record. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, and, you know, Pearl Jam came in and Alice came in. Rick was in the limelight there for, for really the first half of the 90s. He was he was like the A-list producer. So, like, he worked with Bon Jovi. They didn't do that here, but Rick went off somewhere else, did Bon Jovi. He did Nickelback up in Vancouver. So he was, like, doing some of the biggest records of the day. And then as the record industry changed, you know, a little away from the grunge scene, uh, Rick was doing less records, basically. And I think, you know, he started looking at retirement at, the, at some point you know, he just did so well during that time period so the last half of the 90s he was kind of stepping back he wasn't working as much and uh you know in, like i said in 2006 me and my co-owner friend jeff ott who who was an engineer as well we took over the studio we bought the studio from rick and raj and then a few years later eric lullivar our third partner bought in with us um and Rick, uh, Rick kind of went into stuff on retirement. He was still producing a little bit now and again. And unfortunately, he passed away from a, a, a blood clot. Oh, that's sad. So it's very sad. He was a brilliant, well, he's a brilliant person in, in, in many ways. But uh, I, I, I got to say, I learned most of what I know about music production from, from Rick and watching, just watching him work, observing him work with bands like Alice in Chains and, and Pearl Jam. Yeah, well... God rest his soul. Hope he's in a better place now. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, thank you. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what you see, make sure to subscribe for more. All the videos on this channel are original. I'm the one conducting all the interviews and editing all the videos together. So if you guys like what you see and you want to support, the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe. Lots more to come.